Need some new Commander cards? Well, you can pre-order Commander Legends now from our amazing sponsor, Card Kingdom. Just head on over to cardkingdom.com. Hello, everyone. It's Seth, probably better known as Seth from Olive. And it's time for our an ultimate edition of Commander Legends Daily Spoilers. That's right, tomorrow the whole set comes out. We'll get the entire thing tomorrow, but today we still have some ridiculous cards to talk about, including a mythic that might be one of the best in the entire set. I don't even know, but anyway, we should probably jump into it. Start talking insane new Commander Legends cards. And first up today, we have a red mythic. The mythic I was mentioning, Hellkite Courser, and who this card does things. Six mana, six five flying dragon. When it enters a battlefield, you may put a commander you owed from the command zone onto the battlefield. It gains haste at the beginning of your end step. It goes back to the command zone. So essentially, Hellkite Courser is kind of like a sneak attack, but only for commanders. In fact, what Hellkite Courser is to sneak attack, I think Jeweled Lotus is to Black Lotus. It is an extremely powerful card. We've seen Sneak Attack via Stable Back to Legacy. We see Black Lotus, the best card in the history of Magic, but it only works for Commanders. However, even with this restriction, I think the Hellkite Courser is absolutely absurd. Like, picture this. Here's the easiest thing you do with this card. You do a little ramping, you play your Soul Ring, maybe on turn three or four you slam your Hellkite Courser, and put an Ur Dragon into play to start drawing cards, putting more big permanents into play, that is absolutely insane. Like, that is the simplest thing I can think that you would do with this card. And if you're an Ur-Dragon deck, you already want a bunch of dragons, so it seems like an auto-include in decks like Ur-Dragon, or essentially any deck with a big dragon as your commander. So that's number one. On the other hand, this works with a lot of sweet commanders, especially commanders that do something when they attack. I think people have overlooked Gishath. I know Gishath is a dinosaur commander, but I still think I would play Hellkite Courser in my Gishath deck just as a way to sneak Gishath into play with haste, smash the opponent, hopefully dump a bunch of dinosaurs into play. You can potentially one-shot people with a Tarka if you have like a pump spell and double strike. You can Nicole Bolas, which is another hilarious one, just to like wrath someone's hand with one attack from Nicole Bolas. So any commander that is expensive and has powerful attack triggers, it's really good with, or powerful enter the battlefield triggers as well. So I feel like Hellkite Corsair actually fits in quite a few decks, and that doesn't even include the possibility of going deep with it. If you want to go deep, we have been talking about Sundial of the Infinite shenanigans throughout this spoiler season, thanks to Obeka being printed, but Halkai Corsair with Sundial of the Infinite, or Obeka, or Discontinuity, anything like that, you can put your commander into play and keep it forever. So go back to the Erdragon line we were talking about. For one extra mana in a Sundial of the Infinite, you Halkai Corsair, you get your massive commander on the battlefield, and then, before it would go away at the end of turn, you just use Sundial of the Infinite to end the turn in exile that trigger, and you get to keep your commander forever, which is even more frightening. So, Halkai Corsair, I actually am kind of a little bit concerned about how powerful this card is. I think this card, while it doesn't go in every deck, I wouldn't say, in the decks it goes in, with those big attack commanders, it is going to be one of the most powerful cards in that deck. It's hard for it to ever be bad. Like, if you can ramp into it on turn three or turn four, you're going to get an insane amount of value. And then later in the game, once your commander's died and the commander tax is really high, it's another way to get a attack or activation out of your commander that doesn't require paying a million mana because of the commander tax. Uh, so I think this card is actually really, really good. In fact, I'm actually a little bit concerned about it. I don't really like cards that specifically refer to the command zone. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. It feels forced and weird, but it is undoubtedly one of the most powerful cards for the commander format in this entire set. If you're playing a big commander, put this in your deck. It is going to be really, really, really good. We also got a Mythic Angel, a Chroma Vision of Ixdor, and this is another pretty sweet card. So it's a partner. It's a seven mana white legendary angel. You get a 6-6 six, six with flying first strike, vigilance, and trample. At the beginning of combat on your turn, each of your creatures get plus one, plus one if it has flying, plus one, plus one if it has first strike, and so on. For double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, protection, reach, trample, vigilance and partner. So essentially, a million mechanics. Like, if you hit all of those somehow, your creatures are going to get, what, like plus 13, 13 or something? Absolutely insane. So it is worth mentioning that a Chroma doesn't actually pump itself, but still, you got a 6-6 six, six ability, so I think that's fine. The 
thing I love about this card is it has an easy home. Either in an Odric deck or playing Odric in an Akroma deck, you can go easy direction. The other thing that's really hilarious is it's kind of a combo with Akroma's Memorial, which gives all your stuff Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Trample, Haste, Pro Black, Pro Red. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if each protection counts separately for Akroma, but worst case, if you have Akroma's Memorial and Akroma, not only do you have this huge, amazing stack of abilities, you also are giving all your creatures plus six, plus six, which is absurd, and they're trampling over. It essentially just wins the game. If you get a Chroma and a Chroma's Memorial going, you should just kill people with like a single attack. It is going to be absolutely ridiculous. So, Easy Home and Odric combos with the Chroma's Memorial. As far as partner pairings, if you want to go meme mode, this is a way to make your Rogic a little better. It actually has four of those abilities, so it, all of a sudden it's a zero mana four five, which that sounds pretty busted. Get in there with your Rogic. We also have Kamal, Heart of Krosa, which is kind of cute because it gives lands Vigilance, Indestructible, and hey, guess that's three abilities. So four, two mana, turning a land into a 1-1, one, one, they're actually going to be 4-4s, four, and then they're going to get the pump from Kamal, so they're going to be 7-7s. Seven, so that's another sweet way to close out the game if you want to play like green-white partner ramp with a Chroma in Kamal. We also have some other decks where this could be a pretty good home. I think a Cathriel would definitely want it because you have the keyword soup thing going on. Any sort of angel deck, any of the Avincins or other angel archetypes, a Chroma seems like an easy inclusion. Most angels have at least flying, and then some of them have extra abilities as well. So Angel Tribal could want it too. So I think Acroba, it's really powerful, and it even has a signature card, which is absolutely absurd with Acroba. And we gotta talk about Acroma's Will, because Acroma's Will, this might be the best of the cycle. I know I said that about the red one, but that was before Acroba's Will came out. It's rare that white has the best card of a cycle, but I think in this case it probably does. So Acroma's Will, four mana instant, you choose one or both if you have your commander. Creatures you control get flying, vigilance, and double strike into London Turd, or creatures you control get lifelink, indestructible, protection from all colors until end of turn. The key here is, if you're playing in a Chroma deck, you're giving all your creatures six abilities. So not only are you getting Flying Vigilance Double Strike, and getting protection from everything so your opponent can't block, and indestructible to your stuff and guy, and life gain to get a bunch of life, but all your creatures will be getting at least plus six plus six if you cast this in your pre-combat main phase thanks to a Chroma's ability. So essentially, a Chroma's will with a Chroma, it just wins the game. It's like an insane white overrun that gives you a ton of abilities so I think that's a easy combo if you're playing a chroma deck you want a chroma's will however a chroma's will is even better than that I think this card is just a new white staple if you look at what this card does one option is flying crane technique which is a six mana three color card that sees fringe play in commander but a chroma's will it's one color and two less mana and it's essentially the same thing rather than untapping your creatures that you give them vigilance but if you cast a pre-combat main phase it works exactly the same. All your creatures are untapped, they get flying and double strike. And then you also have the defensive mode of Acroma's Will, where you can cast it at instant speed to give your creatures lifelink, indestructible protection, making it like a slightly more expensive, but actually powered up because you're getting protection as well. Unbreakable formation, a flawless maneuver that you're never going to cast for free. So I think Acroma's Will is just absurd. I think this is a card that if you're playing a white-based creature deck, I think you want this almost 100% of the time. If you look at those last cards we were talking about, like Flying Crane Technique, Unbreakable Formation, the protection spells, like Unbreakable Formation, they're staples of any white creature deck. Odric, Got a Turtle, Akedra, Kahira, and then Flying Crane Technique, it's a tough comparison because it's six mana and it's three colors, but it does show up in like Shu Yun, some partner pairs like Bruce Tarlin and Shy. I think Akroma's Will is just strictly better than Flying Crane Technique, though, so I think that opens up even more possibilities. But all this to say, I feel like if you're playing a creature heavy white deck or a white X deck, this is a card you want in your deck. It is really, really hard for it to be bad. It's good offensively to close out the game, it's good defensively to protect your creatures from wrath and removal spells, which means it's going to be really hard for for it to be bad. If you're winning, it's good, so you can force through more damage and win. If you're losing, it's good, because you can protect your creatures from a wrath and maybe catch back up. So a Chrome as well, I think this is a new staple. I think you put this in every white creature deck that you can, and it's very rarely ever going to be bad. And if you're playing a Chroma herself, you get that additional upside. 
of just this absurd free win. Everything gets all the abilities, plus six, plus six. You can't block it because of protection, win the game. So Acroba's will, really, really strong white card. We also got Dawn Glade Regent, a pretty interesting seven drop Monarch card. So seven mana, eight, eight elk, uh, Ogo, Ogo Tribal. When Dogblade Regent enters a battlefield, you become the Monarch. As long as you're the Monarch, permanents you control have Hexproof. So Dogblade Regent kind of compares to a couple of pseudo-staples in green, I would say. Archetype of Endurance, giving all your creatures Hexproof on an 8-drop, also gets rid of your opponent's Hexproof. Asceticism on an enchantment gives your stuff essentially Hexproof, and you can regenerate. Dogblade Regent, I think it's better than these cards. So the downside is, if you lose the Monarch, you lose the protection. Archetype Endurance, as long as it's on the battlefield, it has Hexproof, all your creatures have Hexproof, and you don't have to worry about losing the Monarch. On the other hand, the upside of Dawnglade Regent is you get to become the Monarch, and drawing cards is really good, and being the Monarch is really good, so I think it's worth the risk. So if you look at cards like Archetype of Endurance, that's a card that mostly fits in big green creature decks. Omnath, Locus of Mana, Vorinclax, Mayel, Nykia. I feel like Dawnglade Regent can have mostly the same home. If you're a green ramp deck and you want to protect your stuff and you like drawing cards, there's not a whole lot of downside to playing Dawn Grade Regent. It's going to be hard for it to ever be bad because being the monarch is good, protecting your stuff is good, and green decks tend to ramp a lot, so you can get up to seven mana pretty easily. So if you're playing a big mana green creature deck, Dawn Grade Regent, at least in the conversation, as a way to protect all of your stuff and also draw you some extra cards. So yeah, this card's really good. It's even a creature, so you can do some blink shenanigans if you want to, which is kind of a nice upside keep resetting it to maintain the monarchy and all around just a really solid card good for any deck that's going to have enough mana to cast it for the most part we also got a pretty interesting potentially repeatable cascade spell in ingenuity edge so seven mana cascade pay one second artifact return target artifact you control to its odor's head so ingenuity edge it reminds me a little bit of ethereum horn sorcerer little bit of spite of his shaw throat in essentially you can cast this cascade pay one tap it sack a random artifact get ingenuity edge back to your hand cast it again cascade again the only issue here is cascade is very high variance so you're spending seven mana you could at best get a six mana spell and that's probably worth it most of the time. On the other end, you get a random mana rock, mana dork, and then you're spending seven mana for like a one or two mana spell. So it is a very high risk plan, which probably makes it more of a fun card than an actual like staple card. On the other hand, there are some decks that are already playing easy to sacrifice artifacts. If you're a deck that's playing like Icker Wells, Sprigs, Chromatic Spheres, Chromatic Stars, I think Ingenuity Engine goes up in value. And these are mostly decks that are already doing artifact shenanigans like Slow Bad or Pian Care. And Duretti, Bosh, Shatter Gag Bros. In decks like this, you're going to have the Sacrifice Fodder. Plus, worst case, you can Ingenuity Engine, Cascade, and then Sacrifice the Engine. Maybe you get it back later from your graveyard with a Buried Root or something. So I think if you're playing an Artifact Sacrifice deck, this goes up a lot in value. The other place that it's kind of interesting is in big colorless decks. Colorless decks are all about ramping anyway. They're going to, in the late game, probably have extra mana rocks that they don't really care about. So you can play this, do some Cascading as you're building towards your Cozy or Ulamog or Emrakul, and then in the late game, sack your mana rocks, do it again if you need to. And maybe the most fun combo for the card, I think, is Master Transmuter, where you can just keep picking this up for one mana and putting another artifact into play to boot. The downside is, of course, as we talked about before, you don't know where you're going to cascade into. So seven mana to get something that costs between one in six mana Ugh, that's risky it is a risky effect but it still can do fun shenanigans one thing i did want to point out is cascade is a cast trigger so don't plan on copying it with Fraxine metamorph that's not going to work Brogoing it to blink it that's also not going to work so you do have to hard cast it so i think this is mostly a card for artifact shenanigan decks artifact reanimator decks uh, duretti style decks where you're sacrificing artifacts anyway or maybe big colorless decks so not a busted card by any means but definitely a sweet, interesting, repeatable cascade effect. We also got Glacian Power Stone Engineer. So six mana, three, five, legendary human artificer partner. You can tap it, tap X artifacts you control. Look at the top X cards of your library. Put one of those cards in your head, the rest into your graveyard. So this is very similar to Muzio, actually, except Muzio cares about having one big artifact. Also requires a bunch of mana, but it is a way you can 
tutor through your deck, essentially. If you have artifacts on the battlefield, Glacian, if it sits out and you have random artifacts to tap, this is generating a lot of value, even filling your graveyard, which is nice. On the other hand, the concern I have for Glacian is there's a lot of good blue artifact commanders. We got Memnarchs, we got Padims, we got Akubs, we have Sidris, we have Sharubs. There's so many good blue-based artifact commanders. Is this actually going to beat out some of the other options? Uh, I don't know. And then your main deck, it's a little slow. You got to tap with it. So I'm wondering if, even though it has potential to be powerful, if we just have so many good options, it's a little bit worse. So I think that's where the partner really comes in. I think that's a big upside of this card. There are some good partner pairs for it. You can go like aggro with a Kiri. You can play Keshik or Amrex, two new artifact base, uncommon uh, partner commanders from Commander Legends itself. And I think that's the upside. So there are good partners for it and that is how you build a rug Glacian, i think if you're just playing a normal deck i think i'd rather play one of the busted artifact commanders we already have it doesn't do anything that interesting it just kind of draws you cards but with the right partner pairing i think it can do some pretty good things so Glacian. Not busted, a little bit overcosted, but a powerful card advantage, almost tutoring engine on a board full of artifacts, plus fill your graveyard can be a bit of upside. We also got Galanra Caller of Wildwood and Galanra, kind of interesting partner. So three mana, one, two legendary elf druid. You can tap it to add a green, and when you spend this mana to cast a spell with converted mana cost six or greater, you draw a card. It also has partner. So this seems built to go with Brideland. We have two six CMC or greater uh, commanders now, so it seems like a ready-built partner pair that you play these two together. They work well together. The other place that I think Galanra has some potential is Amodi. In the 99, that is, because Modi, of course, doesn't have commander, despite what I thought a couple days ago we did our video, but it's another card that cares about spell six or greater. I think the bigger deal with Galanra isn't to play it as your commander. I think that's actually where it's maybe weakest. Where I do like it is just as a mana dork in a green deck. If you look at big mana green decks, Kaltas and Omnath, Locus of Manas and Gore Claws, they're going to have a lot of spells with converted mana cost six or greater. You're going to want mana dorks in those decks anyway, and this is a good one. Even though it only taps for one mana, and it is a three drop being able to potentially draw an extra card every single turn that is a very powerful upside on your mana dork so while i'm not super excited to play it as my commander outside of those janky six cmc tribal decks we were just talking about i am excited to play it as a mana dork in my big mana green decks because can't complain about drawing cards, and it is a pretty functional 3-mana mana dork. Speaking of interesting uncommons, we got a sweet uncommon monarchy card. So Feast of Succession, with amazing Seb McKinnon art, as always, 6 mana, all creatures get negative 4, negative 4 until end of turn, you become the monarch. So this is essentially an expensive languish with a huge upside, and the upside is you become the monarch. We've seen a bunch of monarchy cards at lower rarity, most of them seem overcosted by two-ish mana. So apparently that's how Wizards values the Monarchy. Roughly, becoming the Monarch is worth about two mana in Wizards' eyes. So Feast of Succession, let's assume it's roughly as good as Languish. I will say, I like this synergy between being a pseudo-wrath and giving yourself the Monarchy. Like, if you wrath the board and become the Monarch, it's less likely your opponents can steal the Monarch, which makes it more likely you'll draw multiple cards as the Monarch. So I do like that synergy. The issue is... Languish isn't a very good card. Like, Languish, if you look at the Black Wrath ranking in Commander, it does see the fringiest of play, but really, it ranks behind Toxic Deluge, Damnation, Living Death, In Garrick's Wake, Decree of Pain, Crux of Fate, Black Sun Zenith. It's like the 10th most played Wrath or something, 9th most played Wrath in the format. So even if we grant that Feast of Succession is as good as Languish, or maybe even slightly better, let's go wild and say it's even better. The Monarchy's worth three mana, so it's even better than a Languish. Is being a little bit better than Languish enough to show up in your deck <laughs> over Toxic Deluges and Damnations and all the other Wrath options available? I'm actually not sure that it is. So that's kind of the issue. While the card does synergize with itself nicely, ugh, what it does just isn't that good in Commander because creatures are big in Commander, so giving something negative four, negative four isn't really all that great. The decks where Languish does show up are normally black decks, often ones that care about 
creatures dying and want to play a ton of Raz, but also don't want to kill their own commander. Like, uh, Kothavid, Demon Lord Belzenok, Axrod Gunners, and obviously fringe decks, not really top tier black commanders. But in these decks, you do get a bit of an upside. Like, yes, you're not going to wrath the whole board, but you get to keep your commander, you get to wrath a bunch of things, and you hopefully get some triggers off of your commander or whatever. So, I think Feast of Succession, it's in the conversation for certain archetypes, but it's not a staple just because Languish isn't that good. Even though a Wrath that makes you the Monarchy is sweet, if this was a hard Wrath, I would be very hyped for it. If this was six mana hard Wrath, you become the Monarchy, card would be great. But six mana, maybe Wrath some things, but not everything, is a lot, lot worse even when you're becoming the Monarch. We also got Quain Traveling Meddler. So, Quain... I don't know about this card. I mean, it does do something I really love, which is draw cards, but it's a two-mana Azorius Legend, a legendary rabbit wizard. That's right. Legendary rabbits are a thing now. Tab it, each player may draw a card. Then each player who drew a card this way gains one life. You get a 1-3. So this is a card that, I mean, it's funny. There's a legendary rabbit. I think it's mostly a meme. I would play it in group hug decks for sure. It's kind of like a copy of the Crescent Moon, although with a bit of a downside, which is it's a May ability, so you can't force your opponent to draw a card. If you want to go, like, punish you for drawing card shenanigans, this actually doesn't work because if your opponent's going to, like, take damage or something horrible from drawing a card, they can just be like, no, I'm not interested. So you can't really force your opponent to do anything they don't want. On the other hand, if you want to build, like, blue-white group Pug. It's a reasonable choice for a commander. Going into white, you do get like Arbiter of Null Ridge, Benevolent Offering. Kind of tough to be missing green. I think you'll also play it in other group hug decks. Maybe a more hilarious way to play it is to play it in stacks. I know, I know, I know. It's super, super mean. But if you play Quan is your commander in a stack stack, sure, you're letting everyone draw cards, but can your opponent actually cast the cards if you're staxing them with Thalias and Leonin Arbiters to tax their mana? Hull Breacher just shuts it down altogether, so you can kind of just draw an extra card every turn for free on your two drop which is a powerful ability so i think there are shenanigans for this on the other hand don't expect to go rabbit tribal there is exactly one rabbit in blue and white in all of Bazic, and i think there's four altogether, which is Vizardrix, which is an absolutely horrible card i know it says beast there it's been eroded to be a rabbit or maybe it's like a nightmare rabbit but it is a very scary rabbit so quan I mean, it's a fun card. I could imagine myself playing it in the 99 because I like drawing cards. Maybe you can get some political favors out of your opponents. They're not going to kill it, kind of Party J style. Because who doesn't like drawing an extra card every turn? Like, no one's going to complain about that. Actually, just revealing Quan as your commander, probably going to get a cheer from the rest of the table. And maybe people won't attack you for a while because they want you to let them draw cards. But... I don't think it's a super powerful commander. I think it's more of a flavor card. Being a legendary rabbit, and who knows, maybe we get rabbit support in the future. We got dogs, we got cats. Maybe rabbits is next. In two years from now, when we're talking about this card, it's like dominating CDH tables and rabbit tribal. Stranger things have happened. It's 2020 after all. It's a weird time. So maybe rabbit tribal's the next big thing, but we're going to have to wait for some more rabbits to make that happen. We also got Soul of Eternity, which, meh. <laughs> Seven mana, star star, avatar, it's power toughness equal to your life total, you can encore it for nine. This is quite literally Sarah Avatar that has Encore. It is exactly that for the most part. So the Encore is nice. Like getting back from the graveyard, smashing everyone with this huge threat is cool. Sarah Avatar though is more of an archetype staple than a staple. The one deck where it is a true staple is Brian Stoudar uh, because flinging it is pretty insane. Like if you're at 40 life and you fling a soul at eternity of someone, you're probably just going to kill them and then you can Encore it and fling it to someone else and kill them and attack someone with the other token. So there is some synergy there and I I think it is an auto include if you're playing Brian. On the other hand, uh, maybe life gain decks will want it. Some like Everdex and Treva occasionally play Sarah Avatar. And this is an upgrade, but it's so similar that I don't think it's enough of an upgrade that it's going to really move the needle. So I think this is an okay card for life gain decks, a sweet card for fling style decks. And other than that, that's basically Sarah Avatar with a bit of an upgrade thanks to Encore. 
We also got Body of Knowledge, and this is a pretty sweet avatar. Five mana star star, power and toughness, each equal to the number of cards in your hand. You have no max hand size, and when it is dealt damage, you get to draw that many cards. So Body of Knowledge, it's essentially a very upgraded illusory ambusher with the card draw ability, combined with kind of over being of miss, I think is the easiest way to look at it, as a creature with power and toughness, equal number of cards in your hand. They can get really big with the upgrade of of also giving you no max hand size. So body of knowledge, I think this card's actually pretty exciting. I think if you are playing big card draw decks, uh, Nin, Miloku, Tishana, Prime Speaker Zagana, this is an easy inclusion in your deck because no max hand size is going to have value. It's going to be a massive creature and you get some extra synergies like being big and then Prime Speaker to draw more cards, Nin pinging it potentially to draw even more cards. So you get some cool synergies there. So I think that's the main home for this card. Also, another comparison for this is Swans of Burnagold. So Swans, it works for any player. So if your opponent damages it, they get to draw cards. Body of Knowledge only works for you, but this still opens up some really sweet card draw combo shenanigans similar to Swans. Like, for example, Body of Knowledge, Blasphemous Act. That's dealing 13 damage. You're going to draw 13 cards. That is pretty good for potentially one mana. Or Body of Knowledge, Volcano Heliod. You take a bunch of damage, throw a bunch of damage at your Body of Knowledge, draw 20 cards, 40 cards, depending on your life total. So this could be an insane card draw spell if you're willing to build around it swan style just a little bit. It's going to be really, really powerful. So Body of Knowledge... I like this card. It does a lot of things. It draws cards, which is never bad. It gets big, so it can block and maybe even attack if you decide you want to kill people and stop drawing cards. So just a solid all-around card, although one that gets better in card draw tribal decks, where you have massive card draw spells, where having no max hand size has value, or if you want to go swan self-damage, try to hit this for a bunch, draw a ridiculous amount of card shenanigans. We also got a sweet Boros Spirit Soldier Legend, Bell Baraka Spectral Sergeant. So four mana Boros Star 5. Note the converted mana cost of each card as it's put in exile. Bell Baraka's power is equal to the greatest noted number for this turn. So whatever card goes into exile, its power is the biggest one. So if you exile something huge, it's going to have a lot of power. If you don't exile anything, it's nothing. It only lasts for one turn. In the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. So that means it kind of pumps itself, hopefully, as long as you don't hit a land. So, Bell Borka is actually a pretty powerful card. It compares to, like, Chandra's Pyromancer, Outpost Siege, as the red card draw, where, yes, you only get to play the card for one turn, but still, it's an extra card every single turn. And Boros is a color combination that has gotten better thanks to red, but can always use more card draw. And this is a pretty powerful draw an extra card, personal Howling Mind type effect for your Boros deck. As far as playing it as a commander... I guess you're like Exile Tribal. You try to like Swords to Plowshares, the biggest thing your opponent has, and smash him with your commander or have Rest in Peace so everything goes to Exile or Banishing Light, which is, I guess, kind of a unique build-around idea. Will that actually be a strong way to play a deck? No, but it is unique. We haven't had like Exile Tribal being a thing, and Belborka is perfect for that style of deck. I also think that this is just a card that you play in almost any Boros deck. Like, drawing an extra card each turn is really good. A four mana, five toughness that creature that could potentially get massive is also not bad. So if you're playing, I don't know, Iroas or Feather, Winota, Fire Song, I don't really care. If you're playing a Boros deck, I think this is at least in the conversation. It's just a pretty decent creature that draws you an extra card each and every turn. Also sweet as a Boros control commander. Not so much because you want the power and toughness into one-shot people Voltron style, but because in your control deck, drawing cards is even better, so if you want to go controlling, uh, I think Bell Borka is even a better option. So I really like this card. Boros needs more card draw. While I'm skeptical of it being a great commander, I do think the Exile Tribal idea is at least funny, and it would be a good, like, lower-powered casual deck, probably. But I really like this as a 99 card, just to keep drawing extra cards. We also got a pretty spicy Naya legend, a new Jared. And our new Jared, it is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three human warrior in the Naya colors. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent 
becomes a monarch and you can't become the monarch this turn but then it has a sweet static ability where if damage would be dealt to it while you're the monarch you prevent that damage and put that many plus one plus one counters on it so i think this is actually a pretty absurd really exciting monarch commander even though that might sound counterintuitive that you're giving your opponent the monarch but if you're playing a monarch theme deck sure you give your opponent the monarchy for a turn but then you're just gonna immediately steal it back so jared probably the most interesting aspect of the card not the giving your opponent the monarch but the damage prevention make it huge ability kind of like vigor or storm wild caprador these are really interesting cool cards and now with jared you got the perfect commander to build a deck around them yes you're going to need to be able to get the monarchy back for it to work but once you get the monarchy you can make jared really really big really really quickly by throwing mass damage at stuff like this is your blasphemous act earthquake starve extinction tribal commander like picture being the monarch and casting a blasphemous act that's going to make Jared a what? 16 16 all by itself maybe you starve extinction for seven mana that's gonna make it a 23 23 and sweep the board so you just one shot kill anyone like that's a one shot kill combo jared with the monarchy starve extinction someone dies which is absolutely insane so a really sweet unique play style to build around plus if you want to you can go enrage commander that's another interesting way if you're going with the earthquake yourself blasphemous act yourself enrage cards like polyraptor ripjaw raptor work really well with this plan as well even better if you get like bigger on the battlefield and the monarchy thing i don't think it's that big of a deal because i think if you're playing jared as your commander your deck is going to be built to make you the monarch so yes you give someone else a monarch you can't steal it back immediately so someone's going to draw one card but then throne of the high city can let you steal back the monarchy essentially immediately as soon as you pass the turn plus thanks to commander legends we got a ton of sweet new ways to make you the monarchy so if you want to play monarch tribal and play like all the courts in archon of the coronation uh including the new court court of ire or red damage court which eh, we're not gonna go super deep into but you deal two damage to something or if you're the monarch seven damage each turn which is pretty powerful you get to kill one thing each turn but i think it's actually one of the least powerful of all of the court cycle that we've seen but we do have a ton of ways to make you the monarch so i think jared is actually a really sweet commander this is fairly high on my rankings you get sweet political aspects of giving your opponent the monarchy you have weird combo aspects with the mass damage plan after making yourself the monarch and thanks to all the new monarch cards we need a legend to kind of hold that all together to let you play all of them and go to town jared is the way to go it is perfect 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 for that deck so monarchy tribal self damage Shrubrow, Caprador, Vigor, Tribal, and other shenanigans as well. Really sweet new legend. And I know we're getting to the end of spoiler season. And I gotta say, the hard part about this set for me is not finding legends to build around. It's narrowing down the list of legends I want to build around to a level that I can actually function with. Like, there's 20 new legends that I want to build a deck around. There's so many sweet cards. And Jared is now officially on that list and fairly high up the list. It's just a really sweet build around commander. Finally today, and the world of lower rarity cards and reprints uh mira kind of an interesting elf legend although i think it's better in the 99 the ability to pay one in a life to draw a card whenever an elf dies that's nice wrath protection but i don't really think you would play this as your commander as much as in the 99 of your green black elf deck to just get a little extra value you have lots of mana in an elf deck so as your stuff dies you can afford to pay keep drawing through your deck recover from a wrath or whatever otherwise captain vargas ire is another card very similar to the elf we were just talking about it is very aggressive pirate two mana one one that when it attacks all of your pirates get plus one plus one for each time you've cast your commander this game which means you could potentially be giving your pirates plus five plus five or something ridiculous on the other hand i think this is another card that i would rather play in the 99 of my pirate deck than play as my commander you got like admiral bracket brass some good pirate commanders i feel like captain vargas is a good aggressive lord for a pirate deck but it's a little just too aggro i think to be my actual commander and I'd rather add something that generates a little bit more value rather than just being all attack, attack, attack. Impulsive Thief, not a bad treasure pirate. Guildless Commons, a bounce land that is colorless. Kind of a new take on the bounce land, so great for colorless decks, of course. We also got a few, not valuable, but sweet reprints that you're going to want in your collection. Arcane Denial, Counter Spell, Full Art, Swords to Plowshares also has a full art version and has amazing art. This is maybe my favorite new Swords to Plowshare art, at least from the very earliest Swords to Plowshares. It's hard to 
to beat the originals with a lot of these cards, but that art is spectacular, amazing, it looks so, so good. Also, got some new etched foils, or foils etched. Uh, Eureka, can always use more of those, fairly expensive card. Bruce Taro, Ishai, Modralfa, one of my personal favorites, all gonna look spectacular in etched foil. Finally, just rounding it out, we got like some Teamer Battle Rages, Guilt Leaf Winnower downgraded to Uncommon, a Braid, can always use, use more of those for like Modern, it is a staple. Palace Sentinel is another good Monarchy card, but mostly stuff that's just rounding out the set for Limited. And that brings us to the end of our Pan Ultimate day of commander legends daily spoilers so oh my god let me know what you think what do you think of all these new cards which new commander are you most excited to build around what do you think about the red court how good is that actually going to be is that the worst of the cycle i think it's my pick for worst of the cycle how about jared can we build monarchy tribal can we build the Stormwild caprador self-damage deck bella borka can that be a commander or is it just card draw for random boros decks body of knowledge how many cards can we draw with our new swans of burn our goal what about our legendary rabbit soul of eternity is that sarah avatar with the upside of encore gonna be enough to actually see play in formats acroma's will how much of a staple is that what about acroma itself how busted is our new age of legend what about field of succession can our pseudo languish wrath actually see play because of the monarchy is it just too expensive is negative four negative four enough what about ingenuity engine repeatable cascading god glare regent another sweet monarchy card let me know what you think about all these ridiculously sweet cards in the comments and on that note we're done for today, but I'll be back tomorrow with one more daily dose of Commander Legends spoilers. So until then, everyone, have a amazing day, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.